there's this whole field of graph theory called spectral graph theory. And we've gotten to just like, just the smallest taste of it. And it all revolves around finding properties of graphs, invariants of graphs, structures and graphs based on the spectrum of matrices extracted from a graph. In particular, most of, oftentimes it's some kind of graph Laplacian. And so um, the, the question we're going to talk about here is going to lead us into other kinds of drawing or embedding questions. Is that like if I have an eigenvector of the Laplacian, so if L is a graph Laplacian, an eigenvector has this form, right, that the Laplacian times the vector is just some scaling of the vector. So it happens to be a direction, if you think of the vector as a direction, it's the direction such that when I use this matrix at, as a linear transformation, the only effect it has on V is to kind of stretch it out by some amount. Um, hmm. So if you do that, <laughs> it seems like an interesting property. We know that in a lot of other cases in linear algebra, it's useful to have the eigenvectors. Um, so if you computed the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a Laplacian, you might ask, okay, what do we do with them? And so, first of all, let's ask, are they good as invariants? Uh, I did this maybe before, but let me just get through it again so we, we don't forget. Um, I'm going to write down my eigenvalues as uh, lambda 0 up to lambda n minus 1. Wonderful thing about these symmetric real matrices is that they have real eigenvalues. Um, very nice, very handy. And so I'm going to sort them from some, uh, oh, I, just, I sorted them backwards. Sorry, I should start with the smallest one. Let's go smallest to biggest. I'm not sure what I was thinking there. Yeah, so this is going to be the smallest, this is going to be the biggest. Uh, I'll give you a hint, actually the first one is zero. Um, and then I've got the eigenvectors corresponding to those eigenvalues. So that means L times VI is equal to lambda I VI. All right. Now, lambda zero, I said, was going to be just equal to zero. And we know at least one vector that gets scaled by zero, which is the all ones vector. So if I just take a Laplacian times all ones, I'm always going to get zero. So that becomes an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. Um, what about lambda 1? Well, if the graph is not connected, uh, lambda 1 will also be 0. So lambda i will be equal to 0 for all i less than uh, the number of connected components of G. And you can uh, come up with uh, several different bases. One simple thing to do is let the vector eigenvector be constant on just one component at a time and you'll get a different eigenvector for each of the components. So that happens. But if the graph is connected, then uh, all the other eigenvalues will be positive. That's good. We know they're all non-negative because um, that's one of the consequences of being positive semi-definite. And, uh, and so now let's do something interesting with that. So, if I have one of these and I take a permutation of the matrix. So we know as a graph, we would take this graph and if we permuted the vertices, we would get another graph that was isomorphic. Um, and so we'd like to know how does that affect the eigenvalues and eigenvectors? And so just let's work this out. If I took a particular eigenvector and eigenvalue pair, and I take this permuted matrix now, and I permute the eigenvector the same way, well, just by the associative law of multiplication here, I can put this P transpose and P together, which will cancel out, and I'll get P times L V, which is equal to P times, well, L V is just lambda V, that's lambda V, and I can pull the constant factor out, which is lambda times PV, which means PV is an eigenvector of my new permuted matrix. And it's also 
an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. So the eigenvalues don't change when I do this permutation. Uh, the eigenvectors get permuted exactly the same way I permuted the rows and columns of L, which I think makes some sense. And this means, of course, that uh, the eigenvalues, which are sometimes written as the spectrum, that's where we get this term spectral graph theory, are a graph invariant. And so you might ask, what about the... Uh, the eigenvectors. Can we use them in some ways? Are, is, are they, they're not invariant to isomorphism, but maybe they're still useful. Let's see. Um, before I show you how they're useful though, let me tell you how they're even worse than you thought they were. Here's why. Um, you see, it turns out that they're not unique. And I don't just mean that they're not unique up to scaling. I mean that if I actually have two eigenvalues that are the same, then they're going to define an entire space of possible eigenvectors. That is, if I took L times V1 plus V2, so I just take, I just take the sum, I add up two eigenvectors, and uh, these might have been orthogonal, so this new eigenvector is not orthogonal to either of them. Uh, and I just factor it through here, the LV1 plus LV2. And then by definition, this is lambda1 V1 plus lambda2 V2. But lambda1 is equal to lambda2, so I can write this whole thing as lambda1 times V1 plus V2. And you'll see that this then is another eigenvectors. So any linear combination of these eigenvectors that share an eigenvalue will give you a new eigenvector. So is there, is there anything we can do with these? Because they're gonna, they could look wildly different. Right, that when, I comp when I run it through my whatever my favorite computational linear algebra software is and I pull out my eigenvectors, I might just get very different answers um, for isomorphic graphs. Here's, here's what I, I think is maybe the first moment when it really becomes obvious that an eigenvector could be really useful for something. And it's as follows. If I think of the vector, because it's in Rn, I can view it as a function that maps my vertices into the line. Okay, so it, it does something. Okay, so there it is. It takes all, every vertex and it puts it on the line. And so it turns out that if vertices are kind of tightly connected to each other, they're going to end up closer to each other. So the eigenvectors can be used for clustering. What you do is you put them on the line and you try to find um, partitions of your data from, say, everything to the left and everything to the right. And that gives you a kind of partitioning of data that's used for cut problems uh, or, and, and clustering. There's something else you can do. You could take two eigenvectors. Okay, so let's take v1 and v2. And so this now, if I think of it as a function, it's like taking my vertices to the plane. I have two real numbers for every vertex, so it kind of puts the points in the plane. This gives what's called a spectral embedding, uh, although really, let's, let's be careful, let's call it a drawing. And uh, I would say the verdict here, if you're going to try this, is that this is uh, not bad. <laughs> there are some cases where it actually works pretty darn well. Um, gives pretty nice drawings, and uh, I'll show you some examples, and we'll see. Uh, you can decide for yourself. Um, let me uh, pose a couple other questions first here. Like one is, which eigenvectors should you even take? The standard is to take v1 and v2. That is the eigenvectors associated with the two smallest non-zero eigenvalues, and uh, the reason for this is that. 
you know, the Laplacian times that position should give this kind of net difference with the neighbors. And if they're in, if I take two of them, I'm just going to get a net difference of two dimensional vectors. And so if, if the difference with the neighbors is small, that seems kind of reasonable, right? So um, small seems better. <laughs> All right, it is better. So if the difference between each vertex and its neighbors is small, it's kind of like putting each point roughly in the middle of its neighbors. This is roughly the idea. Um, we can make this idea really precise, and we will in the next video. And uh, kind of an interesting question is like, is this the canonical right choice to do? Like, should you pick these two vectors? And I think the answer is no one knows what the canonical answer is. There are um, very simple graphs for which you clearly do not want to choose the, um, these first two. Uh, one example would be a grid. If the grid is much wider than it is tall, then uh, V1, V2 is going to start to look like uh, a sine wave, actually. It's just kind of a neat neat thing that happens almost automatically. Um, so, so there's actually some probably interesting open questions in here about spectral embeddings. Uh, there is a kind of way of reweighting the Laplacian to get a really excellent embedding. It's called, uh, based on something called the Klin de Verdier number of a graph, but we won't get to that. Um, instead, let me show you some embeddings.